Welcome to the congregation of Yahweh. We're here on Yahweh's Sabbath day of Yom Teruah, the Feast of Trumpets. Greetings to those on the internet or those that might be watching live. We hope you enjoy the messages that go out. <clears throat> uh, today I uh, had a little bit I looked up and wanted to read about the significance of this day and some of the traditions uh, surrounding the day and where those traditions came from. And then we'll also uh, have a, a prophetic look at, at what some of these things might might foreshadow. <clears throat> But uh, traditionally, uh, the day is, is also known as Rosh Hashanah, and it's traditionally considered an awakening to judgment. The, uh, the trumpet is supposed to get your attention to uh, what is going to, to fall over the next uh, few days after uh, trumpets. In traditional, uh, Judaism, in traditional Judaism, it's considered the head of the year. It's celebrated as Jewish New Year's Day. The holiday is observed on the first two days of the Hebrew month Tishri, the seventh new moon of the year, which usually falls in September or October and marks the beginning of a 10-day period of prayer, self-examination, and repentance, which culminates on the fast day of Yom Kippur. These 10 days are referred to as Yamim Norim, the days of awe, or the high holy days Rosh Hashanah also commemorates the creation of the universe which is also a uh, tradition we'll touch on here in a minute it's just associated there's a lot of traditional prayers and stuff that go along with it <clears throat> uh, it's also of course we know it as Yom Teruah or Feast of Trumpets the name was changed during Talmudic times uh, tradition stated that the universe was created by Yahweh on Rosh Hashanah or on Elul 25 so that Rosh Hashanah marks the sixth day of creation when Yahweh created Adam and Eve. Rosh Hashanah is also called Yam Ha Zikaron, the day of remembrance. Leviticus 23:24, in reference to the commandment to remember to blow the shofar, uh, to rua, to coronate Elohim as king of the universe. The blast of the shofar is meant to jolt us from our sleep, we are to remember who we really are by remembering that he is our king. According to Jewish tradition on Rosh Hashanah, the destiny of the righteous, the Zedekim, are written in the book of life, and the destiny of the wicked, the Rashaim, are written in the book of death. However, most people will not, according to tradition, most people will not be inscribed in either book but have 10 days until Yom Kippur to repent before sealing their fate. Hence the term Aseret Yemi Teshuva, the 10 days of repentance on Yom Kippur, then everyone's name will be sealed in one of the two books. Consequently, uh, many synagogue prayers and invocations are made to be worthy written in the book of life. <clears throat> The 10 days of repentance, during the 10 days of, of repentance, most people are neither entirely righteous nor entirely wicked. On the day of Rosh Hashanah, the uh, 10 days of repentance provide a time for us to repent and turn wholeheartedly unto Yahweh in order to be sealed into the book of life. These days set the tone. For the coming most holy day of atonement, repentance, prayer, and charity, these are the spiritual virtues of the high holy days and the mood of the tash tashlik ceremony is based upon their heightened observ observance. It is written in the Torah, it is written the first day of the seventh month is to be commemorated as Yom Teruah, sometimes translated as Feast of Trumpets. The word teruah means shouting or raising a noise, and therefore the day was to be marked by making a joyful noise unto Yahweh, Psalms 81, 1 through 4. Of all the Moedim holy days, Yom Teruah is unique, mainly because it's the only holy day that begins on a new moon, and because there's no explicit reason given for its observance other than to rest and to offer sacrifice. After the second temple was destroyed in 70 AD. However, the sages of the Mishnah redefined Judaism and associated Yom Teruah with the start 
of the Jewish civil year. Yom Teruah then became known as Rosh Hashanah, the head of the year. Uh, silver trumpets were originally used to signal camp movements during the journeys to the Promised Land. Later, they were used by the Levites during various temple rituals, especially during the offering of animal sacrifice. They were also sometimes used in times of warfare. These silver trumpets are to be distinguished from the ram's horn trumpet, the shofar, that was explicitly commanded to be sounded during Yom Kippur and during the Yovel Jubilee year. The common consensus among the sages was that the shofar, not the silver trumpet, was likewise used for Yom Teruah. That's found in the, the Mishnah. The shofar was a reminder of the exchange of the divinely provided ram as ransom for Isaac's life and the giving of the Torah at Mount Sinai. <clears throat> As believers, we maintain that Judgment Day has come and justice was served through the sacrificial offering of Yeshua for our sins. He is the perfect fulfillment of the Akedah of Isaac. Our names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life, um, Revelations 13, 8. We do not believe that we are made acceptable in Yahweh's sight by means of our own works of righteousness but that does not excuse us from being without such works as the fruit of the Holy Spirit in our lives. The scriptures clearly warn that on the day of judgment to come, anyone's name not found written in the book of life will be thrown into the lake of fire. The mission states that Adam and Eve were created on Rosh Hashanah, but how did the sages determine this date? By... Uh, by swapping around the Hebrew letters in the very first word of Scripture, they took the word Bereshit. And by taking all the letters found in Bereshit and just jumbling them around a little bit, it actually says on the first of Tishri. So this that's where that tradition came from, was just by jumbling the letters of a word. And uh, so... They decided, well, obviously, I guess, since you can jumble the beginning into the first of tish Tishri, uh, that's how it traditionally became known, as that was the creation date and the head of the year. Um, so it became a, an anniversary of creation and also of um, the creation of, of Adam and Eve on the sixth day. Rosh Hashanah, therefore, uh, represents the day that he began to rule as king of the universe when Adam first opened his eyes and human consciousness was born he immediately understood that Yahweh created all things including himself and according to the Midrash Adam's first words were Yahweh is king forever and ever Elohim then said now the whole world will know that I am king and he was very pleased the birthday of humanity is therefore the coronation day of the king of the universe Psalms 47 celebrates the kingship of Elohim that mentions the shout in Psalms 47 and 5 it says Elohim has gone up with a teruah and Yahweh with the sound of a trumpet shofar the sound of the shofar is meant and by the way you know everything I just read it's, it's tradition it's what the the sages and rabbis uh, you know put in their commentaries but you know uh, these uh, there's no evidence in, in scripture of of um, Yom Teruah being the head of the year. That's they traditionally came up with that. Um, but anyway, the sound of the shofar is meant to awaken our conscience that he is king. Okay, I'm gonna dig into uh, Exodus, and we're gonna discuss some of the the imagery seen around the trumpet and and what this day seems to be indicative of. In Exodus chapter 18, I'm not going to read the whole thing here, but um, I'm going to start in verse 12 of Exodus chapter 18. And you can go all the way back to the, the Egypt story. And well, actually, everything in Scripture has a foreshadow. It's all significant and 
And the more we study it, the more we realize that these things were just examples of future realities. It was his, the, the history of his people that prophesied and, and foreshadowed future events. And I think that, that every little detail, the measurements and all kinds of stuff just have a great uh, significance that, that we're only looking through a glass dimly right now. But, you know, from the, the Exodus story, all the way up to the promised land, it seems to, to foreshadow the life of a believer uh, that, you know, we need to be delivered from the slavery of sin just as the Israelites were delivered from the slavery of Egypt. And as, you know, his, his firstborn needed to be protected during that time, and the only protection was the blood on the doorpost. And um, after you depart from the slavery of Egypt you make your way to the Red Sea. And Paul gives us a glimpse of that foreshadow when he said all of the Israelites were baptized unto Moses in the sea. So once we're truly ready to leave the slavery of sin, we need to be baptized and leave that, that old life of slavery behind. And then he takes us to the mountain to teach us of his ways. And uh, there's a a connection when when they're all coming to the mountain they're preparing themselves for his presence and that's what that's where we're at right now we have chosen to leave the life of the slavery of sin hopefully we've all been baptized and we left that old way of life uh, we're preparing ourselves right now at the mountain learning his ways but preparing ourselves for his presence and um uh, before they prepared themselves for his presence, they had to be tested. He said, I'm going to test you and see if you're going to obey me or not. And he tested them with manna. And right now, we're being tested. And, and uh, before this literally is fulfilled, there's going to be a great test. And, and Revelations talks about uh, plagues and, and, and bad things coming upon the earth. Uh, and people still did not repent of their their sins and of their wickedness and uh, there's going to be a testing and i've touched on this before and i'll just i'll verbally touch on it ag again and just kind of uh touch on where those scriptures are at but there's a 10-day gap there's a 10-day gap from yom teruah to uh, yom kippur and uh you know it's supposed to be a time of repentance and self-examination but I think there is a connection between that and being tested. There's a place in Revelations that says that you will be tested for 10 days. And I believe that that testing of 10 days is whatever's going to happen right before Yeshua return. It's going to be a test for some people and to also bring people to repentance. And I believe that there's another second witness of that in the book of Daniel uh, they were being uh, they were supposed to come into the presence of the king and before they came into the king's presence they wanted to fatten them up with the king's meat and the wine they said please don't let us be defiled with the king's meat or his wine worldliness uh, but let us have pulse and test us for 10 days so they were being tested by what they allowed into their temple for 10 days in preparation if they were found worthy to be in the presence of the king. So <clears throat> that story in the book of Daniel and the testing and revelations, I believe, connects to that 10-day gap between the trumpets and Yom Kippur. And uh, a lot of people think that Yom Teruah is a foreshadow at the sound of the last trump. But technically, that's not the last trump. Uh, the last trump is Yom Kippur. And also, there is a trumpet blown um, at the Jubilee year, which, uh, biblically speaking, that would be the very last trump. And I think that's also very connected. And, and see, what we can do during these feasts, we see, um, we see what's going on in the history of, of Israel. And it seems like there's, there's messages out of each one that build up to a climax of what we see. Uh, we know that, that Moses and the Israelites gathered to Mount Sinai on Pentecost, but the picture there 
is of the second coming and people gathering together to wait for his presence. And what happened? What were they waiting for? Him to come down and speak his word. And we're going to touch on some scriptures here in a minute that when the Messiah returns, he's coming to speak the words of his father through kings and priests and all nations will flow to the mountain for the coronation of the king to hear him speak. <laughs> Hallelujah. Um, so anyway, in in chapter 18 of Exodus, what's going on here is Moses was trying to, to rule and judge for the people by himself. And Jethro said, it's, it's not good for you to do this alone. You need to choose out able men over thousands, over hundreds, over fifties, over tens, and let them judge with you. And I think that's a foreshadow of Messiah pulling out kings and priests to reign with him for a thousand years. And then... Uh, in the, the next chapter here in chapter 19, I'm going to start in verse um, verse 10. And just another little thing. you can, There's illustrations all through the story that we see other places in Scripture. For instance, in verse 4, it says, You see what I did unto the Egyptians and how I bear you out on, I bear you on eagles' rings, wings and brought you unto myself. Revelations talks about the woman that's uh, brought out with the wings of an, uh, of an eagle. Um, in verse 10 and Yahweh said unto Moses go unto the people and sanctify them today and tomorrow let them wash their clothes and be ready against the third day for the third day I will come down in the sight of all the people upon Mount Sinai now shall set bounds unto the people round about saying take heed to yourselves that you go not up into the mount or touch the border of it whosoever uh, touches the mount shall surely be put to death there shall not a hand touch it but he shall surely be stoned or shot through, whether it be beast or man, and shall not live when the trumpet sounds long, they shall come up to the mountain. So the you know, that's that's one of the, the things that connects this for me is these trumpets throughout scriptures and their significance. And here you've got people coming up to the mountain at the sound of the trumpet, and we're gonna show some other things about this mountain, this 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 mountain imagery is significant it also ties in with the transfiguration they were up on a mountain and um right before i'm just i'm letting it flow here right before the transfiguration in the previous chapter the last verse of the previous chapter he says there are some here which will not taste death until they see the kingdom come okay well, that's kind of obscure until you see what happens in the next verse. He goes up on the mount and he is transfigured in front of their eyes. The, and the three he was talking about was, uh, I believe, Peter, James, and, and John, if I remember correctly. And there appeared Moses and Elijah there. <clears throat> and I believe that Moses was a foreshadow of those that are, are uh, that die and are raised. And Elijah is... A, a, a symbol of somebody who's changed in the twinkling of an eye. So um, that's those the three men that were standing there. They didn't die because they saw the second coming, the kingdom in a vision. What they they didn't literally see the kingdom come. They saw it in a vision. They saw their king coming, glowing with the brightness of the sun, with those who have been resurrected and those who have been changed. And he came with the law and the prophets. And that's what it's going to look like at the sound of the last trump when the Messiah shall come. And those who are raised from the dead, those who are changed, and he's coming with the law and the prophets to rule over the house of Israel with kings and priests that he has that he is preparing. But anyway, uh, back to Exodus chapter um, 19. In verse uh, 14, And Moses went down from the mount unto the people and sanctified the people, and they washed their clothes. Uh, clothes made white is a repetitious theme uh, throughout Revelations. It says that they washed their robes with the blood of the Lamb. It says that their white robes was the righteous actions of the saints. Uh, <clears throat> verse 15, And he said unto the people, Be ready against the third day. Come not at your wives, a possible tie-in there. In Revelation, it says that they are virgins. Corinthians says that, that Paul said that he uh, has presented the church as a chaste virgin. 
Uh, and it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud and a mount upon the mount and the voice of the trumpet exceedingly loud so that all the people in the camp trembled. And Moses brought forth the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim, and they stood at the nether part of the mountain. And Mount Sinai was altogether on smoke, because Yahweh descended upon it in fire, and the smoke thereof ascended as the smoke of a furnace. And the whole mount quaked greatly. And when the voice of the trumpet sounded long and grew louder, Moses spake, and Elohim answered him in a voice. Uh, in the next chapter, in chapter 20, the Ten Commandments are spoken. And in verse 18, after he spoke the Ten Commandments, and all the people saw the thunderings and the lightnings and the noise of a trumpet and the mountain smoking, when the people stood afar off, they were removed, saw it, they removed and stood afar off. Um, so here, right after he speaks the Ten Commandments, there's also a blowing of a trumpet and a lot of calamity going on in the, in the elements. <clears throat> In Leviticus chapter 23 and verse, verse 24, speak unto the children of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, in the first day of the month, shall you have a Sabbath, a memorial, a blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall do no servile work therein, but you shall offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh, and Yahweh spake unto Moses, saying, also on the tenth day of this seventh month, there shall be a day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation unto you. You shall afflict your souls and offer an offering made by fire unto Yahweh. Um, this is the commandment that you're supposed to have this Feast of Trumpet, but it's never told why. The significance is never given, but we, we draw on its significance from some of the other things that we read in Scripture. Leviticus chapter 25 Starting in verse one, this is it, this seems to to indicate the very last trumpet. In verse one, it says, "And Yahweh spake unto Moses in Mount Sinai, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and saying to them, When you come into the land which I give you, then shall the land keep a Sabbath unto Yahweh six years. Thou shalt sow thy field, and six years shalt thou." Prune thy vineyard and gather in the fruit thereof. But in the seventh year shall be a Sabbath of rest unto the land, a Sabbath for Yahweh. Thou shalt neither sow thy field nor prune thy vineyard. That which grows of its own accord of thy harvest thou shalt not reap. Neither gather the grapes of thy vine undressed, for it is a year of rest unto the land. And it says that you won't reap anything that grows on its own um, that that just seems to me you know something that's growing on its own you won't reap that there's, there's something something there but I'm not going to put my finger on it right now and the Sabbath of the land shall be meat for you for thee and for thy servant and for thy maid and for thy hired servant and for thy stranger that sojourns with thee, and for thy cattle, and for the beasts that are in the land, shall all the increase thereof be meat. And thou shalt number seven Sabbaths of years unto thee, seven times seven years, and the space of the seven Sabbaths of years shall be unto thee forty and nine years. Then shalt thou cause the trumpet of jubilee to sound on the tenth day of the seventh month in the day of atonement shall you make the trumpet sound throughout all the land that to me sounds more like the very last trumpet and you shall hollow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof it shall be a jubilee unto you and you shall return every man unto his possession and you shall return every man unto his family a year of release a jubilee a jubilee shall that 50th year be unto you. You shall not sow, neither reap that which grows of itself in it, nor gather the grapes in it of thy vine undressed, for it is the jubilee. It shall be holy unto you. You shall eat the increase thereof out of the field. In the year of this jubilee, you shall return every man unto his possession. And if thou sell anything unto thy neighbor or buyest anything of thy neighbor's hand, thou shalt not oppress one another. Okay, in uh, Numbers chapter 10, in 
Uh, this is just uh, a lot of different illustrations of the trumpet being used in verse 1 and Yahweh spake unto Moses saying make thee two trumpets of silver of a whole piece shalt thou make them that thou mayest use them for calling of the assembly and for and for the journeying of the camps and when they shall blow with them all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation and if they blow but with one trumpet then the princes which are the heads of the thousands of Israel shall gather themselves unto thee and when you blow an alarm then the camps that lie at the east part shall go forward and when you blow an alarm a second time when the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey they shall blow an alarm for their journeys but when the congregation is to be gathered together you shall blow but you shall not sound an alarm and the sons of Aaron the priests shall blow with the trumpets and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations and if you go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresses you then you shall blow an alarm with the trumpets and you shall be remembered before Yahweh your Elohim and you shall be saved from your enemies also in the day of your gladness and in your solemn days and in the beginnings of your months you shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings and over your sacrifices of your peace offerings that they may be to you for a memorial before your Elohim I am Yahweh your Elohim uh, <clears throat> Isaiah 27 just got a, a few more things to cover. We'll close out here in just a few minutes. Isaiah 27. Isaiah 27 and verse 13. And it shall come to pass in that day that the great trumpet shall be blown and they shall come which were ready to perish from the land of Assyria and the outcasts of the land of Egypt and shall worship Yahweh in the holy mount at Jerusalem so here we have another trumpet and mountain connection and let's go to Isaiah chapter 2 I think this is also significant you know picture in your mind all of Israel coming together at the mountain, sanctifying themselves, getting ready for the presence of the king uh, to hear his word. Uh, the outcasts flowing to the mountain for worship. In Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2, it shall come to pass in the last days that the mountain of Yahweh's house shall be established in the top of the mountains, it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. All nations are flowing to the mountain, and many people shall go and say, Come, you let us go up to the mountain of Yahweh, to the house of the Elohim of Jacob, and he will teach us of his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem, and he shall judge amongst the nations and shall rebuke many people, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruny hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Um, also in Ezekiel chapter 34, so right here, this this coming to the mountain and and. Uh, learning of his ways and his word and his law going out seems to be connected to what we see in Ezekiel chapter 34 you have a group of, of sheep that's not getting fed by their pastors by their shepherds and so Yahweh says that he's going to seek them out as the good shepherd I'm going to start uh, in your own time go back and read that whole chapter it's just amazing and it it directly connects with uh, john chapter 10 when M messiah said i'm the good shepherd other sheep i have which are not of this fold them also must i bring them they may be one flock under one shepherd that's what we see going on here in verse 12 of 34 as a shepherd seeks out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and dark day and I will bring them out from the people and gather them from the countries and will bring them to their own land and feed them upon the mountains of Israel so here he has a gathering of his people to the mountain to be fed and I believe that they're going to be fed with the law that goes forth from Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem through the kings and priests that he has chosen to do that. 
And it, it goes on to say that the false shepherds have trampled the pastures and, and, and muddied the pastures so that the sheep can't be fed. And I think that's a contamination of Yahweh's word by adding to it and taking from it that people can't get the nourishment they need from his word. So he's coming back to actually feed his sheep with thus saith Yahweh. And I was actually just talking to somebody yesterday, you know, about how people get so caught up on all these divisive things that have nothing to do with your salvation. And they asked me how I felt about those things. And I, I was like, you know, if, if it has nothing, if it's not salvific and it has nothing to do with your entrance into the kingdom and it's a endless debate, why waste your time? I've got uh, a lot, I think, you know, we have a lot better things to do with Yahweh's time than have endless debates that cannot be solved, that cannot be resolved. Let's talk about the significant issues. Um, let's talk about moral issues. And as a matter of fact, you know, that's the only thing in Scripture that I see division over was uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. He said, when there's someone that claims to be a brother, claims to be. As a matter of fact, he goes on to say, you know, before I told you not to associate with, with drunkards and fornicators and adulterers and, and railers and all that, but let me clarify what I meant. If a person calls himself a brother and does these things, don't even eat with such a one. And those are moral issues. They're not pronunciation issues. They're not calendar issues. They're not the shape of the world issues. They're a person that claims to follow the Messiah and is living in direct opposition to his character. That's the person after a rebuke. Actually, I believe Paul said after the first and second rebuke rejects such a one as a heretic. So if a person claims to be a follower of the Messiah and is living in open rebellion and wickedness after you rebuke them the first and second time, then it's time to divide. That's what division is. is that's a biblical reason to divide. Not the little hair splitting issues that have endless debates and endless amounts of information that can never be solved because of all the confusion the enemy you know today we're in an information age and the best way to get people to to divide and not get get along is to flood the gates with as much information as possible so they can't decipher what's what's true and, and what's not um also in corinthians uh, Paul, you, you've got groups of people. Some say I'm of Paul. Some say I am of Apollos. And he says, are you not carnal? Are you not fleshly with these divisions that's going on among you? So division and separating for people because of little differences of opinion is fleshly. It's actually a lack of spiritual maturity. Because we have a foundation, he says, there's no other foundation that can be laid. But be careful how you lay on that foundation. But ladies and gentlemen, if a building is on the same foundation, it's still the same building. And our same foundation is Yeshua the Messiah and what he did for us. Everything else is debatable. But that same foundation is what should hold us together. And when it, when, it, when it comes to a time to split in hairs or something, sometimes you got to agree to disagree. And, you know, be careful how you, you build on that foundation. So anyway, uh, one more tie-in. Um, we've talked about coming to the mountain at the sound of the trumpet. All nations coming to the mountain. His sheep coming to the mountain to be fed. The mountain in the last days, his law going forth from Zion and the word of Yahweh from Jerusalem. And something uh, came to me recently, Deuteronomy chapter 31. I'm going to close out with this. I think this kind of ties in with this. And also, you know, trumpets, I'm not sure if I mentioned it, was also known as a day to coronate the king. And... In chapter 31, I'm going to pick up in verse 5. And Yahweh shall give them up before your face, that you may do unto them according unto all the commandments which I have commanded you. Be strong and of good courage, 
Fear not, nor be afraid of them, for Yahweh thy Elohim, it is he it is that do, does go with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. And Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him, In the sight of all Israel, be strong and of good courage, for thou must go with this people unto the land which Yahweh hath sworn unto their fathers to give them, and thou shalt cause them to inherit it. So right now we're about to see the transition from Moses to Joshua. Well, what Moses couldn't do was he couldn't take the people into the promised land. Just like the law, your works of the law, is not what's going to get you in. Now, the reason Moses couldn't take the people into the promised land was because of the weakness of his flesh. Yahweh said, speak to the rock, and because of the weakness of his flesh, he got aggravated and he struck the rock. And because of that, Joshua had to come in for him and take the people into the land. And there's a verse in Romans that spells this out. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, Yahweh sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin to condemn sin in the flesh. What Moses couldn't do, Yahshua came to do. Moses, the law, could not take us into the promised land, but Yeshua came to take us into the promised land. So here we see that transition, and in verse um, verse. 7 and Moses called unto Joshua and said unto him inside of all Israel be strong and of good courage for thou must go in with this people and unto the land which Yahweh hath sworn unto their fathers to give them and thou shalt cause them to inherit it and, and Yahweh he it is that does go before thee he will be with thee he will not fail thee neither forsake thee fear not neither be dismayed and Moses wrote this law and delivered it unto the priests the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of Yahweh, and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying, At the end of every seven years in the solemn, solemnity of the year of release in the Feast of Tabernacles, when all Israel is come to a appear before Yahweh the Elohim, all Israel coming into the presence of the king, in the place which he shall choose, Jerusalem, at the mountain, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in their hearing. All of the law is to be read in the presence of all Israel when they come to the presence of the king at the sound of the last trumpet. Hallelujah.